I'm treating this like another day at the office. It's a little bit weird working from home. I got to say. Yeah, it's been, it's been a little challenging. Um, we got the distraction, at least at my house, I have three teenagers. I've my pets. So I got two cats and a dog. I got my fiance. So, and we're trying to share space while we're both working from home. So it's been, uh, it's been interesting. And then you, at least I get distracted with like chores around the house. Like I'm like, Oh, I'll go empty the dishwasher. Or I'll go do laundry. And then I'm like, Oh, I should be working. So that part's been a little challenging. I, I feel like the toughest part right now, maybe you'd agree with me on this one is as we film this, we would, would have been in Newfoundland. Uh, the team was scheduled to play Newfoundland. It was a new town that neither of us had been to. It was going to be your yearly trip that you make every year to a different city in the ECHL to see how they do things. And this would have been that weekend. So it's a little bit sad from that standpoint. Yeah, I was thinking about that this morning on my run, um, how we would have been there right now. So yeah, it is disappointing. And in the same breath, it's like, you know, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this. Um, the Board of Governors making a decision to cancel the season was the right one. Um, but it was difficult to make that decision. So it is a bummer. I was really looking forward to going to Newfoundland and, and taking the trip with the team and, and learning from that franchise because that's just how we get better is to learn from other teams in the ECHL. Here with Nick Bootland in our Just Winging It second episode of the summer. I got a, a good one from Caleb Hopkins that came in asking, are we limiting fighting with all these new rules that they put in place? Which I think the obvious answer is yes, that's what they're trying to do a little bit with the suspensions that take place after 10 fighting majors. But he, he adds, I'd love to take it back to the old days in the Bootland era with bench clearing brawls when that was a thing. So I thought that was pretty funny. So, oh yeah, uh, I seen some of these on Twitter. So my kids were like, "Hey, you gotta answer those questions." And I'm like, "Well, I'm sure they're gonna come up in the in our little uh, our little uh, webinar here that we're pulling off here." So I, I figured they'd come up for sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're obviously trying to limit the number. Um, I think they're trying to limit those things that get out of hand. Um, and I think the league's done a pretty good job at policing it. I I, I think we're still at an I think we had one player that was close, right? I think Ben Wilson had nine. Yeah, I nine. think yep. that we're not mistaken because we tried to talk to Ben and said, hey, the next one, you better make the next one count when you do it because um, it's going to start costing you games. And, um, you know, I think that if you can be a tough player and not have to fight, um, I think times have changed where the game has changed. Um, I'm reading a book now about the Steve Monitor story written by Ken Dryden, and I can't think of the title of the book off the top of my head right now. I'm about 90 pages in, and um, it, it talks about a little bit of the history of the game in that book as well as what's going on and how the game's changing moving forward. And, um, you know, they talk about the 1950s when things were crazy. Well, tough guys in the 1950s only fought eight times a year, nine times a year seven times a year you know they call it the gordy howe hat trick do we all know how many times gordy howe had a gordy howe hat trick where he had to fight a goal and assist in a game it's only two times <laughs> it's called the gordy howe hat trick and he's done it twice in his career and he played how many games 2000 you know what i mean so one of our guys did it twice last season booter yeah that right exactly right it, it did happen right so Blaney. yeah exactly so um, you know, I don't think we're going to get back to that. I, I, I think what they've done with the bench clear and brawls and things like that, that used to happen when I played is, you know, coming off the bench is an automatic 10 game suspension. And, um, some of those things happened and it, it kind of reminds me of a story if I, I'm going to get a little long winded, but I, when I first moved into our house, uh, in the Kalamazoo and obviously a long time ago, but, um, my neighbors are great people next door. And I said, Hey, you guys want to come to a game? Let me know sometime. Maybe I can get you some tickets. And they came and, it happened to be a game against Muskegon, and um, I think me and Robin Bouchard kind of got into things, and he wasn't a guy who loved to fight or whatever. So I, I think like it kind of like probably sticked him and picked him up a little bit and pitchforked him, and it started a bit of a brawl, and I ended up fighting. And um, I remember going up to the fence the next day or two, and my neighbor's like, "Oh man, I, that was crazy. I'm really sorry about that. And, um, I don't know if we'll be coming to any more games." And I was like, "Oh, why?" And <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? They didn't have fun. I think it was like an eight, seven game or something. And, you know, it was a great game, huge atmosphere or whatever. And they're like, yeah, well, I had to try to talk to my son about my mild mannered neighbor and what he was doing on the ice. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good story to tell. And, um, you know, it, it's not for everyone. And, you know, obviously fans enjoy it. I, I think being team tough is the most important thing. 
Um, I think we actually lacked a little bit of that last year and, and need a little bit more for sure, but I don't think we're going to get back to the old bench clear and brawl days. My last question is probably the most talked about content piece we did this year, and that is the top 10 list of the favorite movie quotes where you appeared in it. You made a, a couple of cameos. Uh, you start in the one that was the, the one from Blades of Glory, where you <laughs> had Michael Michaels, and then you and Joel finished it off with probably the the best impression of Dumb and Dumber I've ever seen with the uh, totally redeem yourself. <laughs> well, my question, I guess, is how did you come up with the courage to bury your chest for the entire world to see? <laughs> um, kudos to you for that one. And the second one is, do you have acting in your future? Is this something you want to continue with these, uh, these movie quotes? Because clearly you got a talent for it. I mean, to be fair, when you have the body of a skater, you do want to show it off. So that's a... <laughs> um, but no, like, I mean, you got to be able to laugh at yourself. And I mean, that wasn't too egregious. So whatever, like, it's just a shirt off. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that was all Marty too. Like he was, he was unreal. I couldn't, I mean, you, you were there. I, I couldn't keep a straight face with that guy. It took me a lot of takes because he was money and like just the tone in his voice and like the way he was like looking at me, like I couldn't, and he had, I don't know if you guys could tell in the video, but he like blacked out a tooth. Um <laughs> and I was just dying, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. And Marty and I have been talking a lot um, throughout the season since that happened about how we want to keep, keep doing some of those. Cause those were pretty fun to film. And um, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully uh, maybe when this quarantine thing gets over, we can, we can all get together and, and film another scene or something. We might have to give you two your own show. <laughs> I wouldn't be against it. It was fun. The former voice of the K-Wings, you know him well, Joe Roberts. What's going on, man? How are you? Hey, uh, it's great to be here. What an honor. What a privilege to be in the first uh, five, first four episodes. Uh, it's pretty. It means you're either running out of guests so quickly that you had to call me or I'm actually in your top four. So I'm going to go with the latter, but glad to be here. Joel Martin actually passed me off to you. So he said, I don't want to do it. Talk to Joe Roberts. I'll do it later. That seems very on brand for Marty, for being honest. <laughs> Congrats on the newborn. Uh, what's what's life been like as a dad? Uh, 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 dirty diapers, um, weird sleep patterns, uh, but a lot of smiles, a lot of joy, a lot of fun. Nora was born uh, 12 weeks ago, so um, our hands have been full, but um, our hearts are full as well. So it's just been a treat in every sense. Um, an amazing journey, and throughout this whole sort of strange stay at home situation. Uh, the silver lining in all of it for me is that I get sort of an unexpected paternity leave to bond with her. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, glass half full, no doubt, obviously we miss being able to do what we love. I know you're experiencing that PD, but like, you know, to take the glass half full, to appreciate the fact that this is time I never budgeted for, uh, is pretty special. So I'm enjoying the ride. You know, we asked the fans for a lot of questions because I knew there'd be some good ones for you since you were here for three years and a good majority of the questions were asking about Nora. I, I mean, uh, Sue Elkema, the, the head of the office officials who you worked with for three years, she wants to know how Nora's doing. Eric Goldstein said, how's Nora handling not having hockey, which I'm sure she's well aware of the, the lapse in hockey. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, my wife, Jessica and I were laughing because during the sort of thick of hockey season, she oftentimes, uh, you know, we travel a lot, guys like you and me and, and we're on the road and it's, it's frustrating for partners a lot of times. Um, and then all of a sudden what was frustrating for her was the fact that there were no more games, there was no more travel and I was at home all the time. So, um, I think in our nine years together, we've seen more of each other in the, these past couple weeks. So, um, that's been kind of funny, but you know, again, like I just sort of defer back to, uh, the time that we have that I never anticipated having has been, uh, just an absolute treat. And, um, to be able to bond with your newborn like that is really, really neat. So, um, you know, she's happy, she's healthy, she's smiley, she's amazing and like warms my heart on every level. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just taking it one day at a time and sort of learning on the fly, which is definitely something that um, we've had to remain flexible with all things. So it, it, it's been fun, though. Uh, one day seems to flow into the next one week seems to flow into the next. Uh, but also an opportunity to be home with my family, which during the season, unfortunately, doesn't happen very often. So that's a good thing. Uh, the kids are being homeschooled. 
Um, and, you know, thank goodness technology being what it is, the world is at our fingertips. I got to say, if this quarantine lasts much longer, uh, my hair is going to start looking like your your hair pretty <laughs> soon, which, is, which isn't a bad thing, I got to say. Yeah, uh, yeah. With, with the barber shops being closed as well, if you guys thought my hair was long before, uh, <laughs> we're in for a long run here. We're joined by Ryan Creelan, the ECHL commissioner. The way this unfolded, uh, it happened so fast. I remember Kalamazoo, we had a game at home the night before everything really kind of unraveled across the sports world. Uh, March 12th, the ECHL decided to suspend operations. March 14th, uh, cancel the rest of the season. Um, what was that like to be a part of front and center behind the scenes, if you don't mind sharing? Uh, I, a, a lot. I mean, chaotic. Uh, things were moving so fast. Um, lots of people to talk to, to try and coordinate everything. Uh, trying to address all the different, uh, I'll say facts, but the facts were changing so rapidly at that time. And, and that continues to this day. Um, but in concert with our board, our executive committee, the PHPA, uh, we were trying to check as many boxes as possible and, and trying to predict the future. And while it was a very difficult decision, a very frustrating decision, um, and I spent countless hours on the phone in a period of 24 to 48 hours. Uh, I'm confident we got it right. We got a question that came in on Instagram that just with some of the adversity you faced, uh, including getting the, the puck up in the eye, that was obviously a scary one. Um, and then the one two seasons ago where, that ended your season, your your lower injury there, your knee injury. How, how did you fight through some of that stuff and, and kind of keep encouraging yourself to come back and give it another shot and and go with a full rehab as quick as you could. Cause I got to think mentally that's tough to do. Uh, it was definitely mentally taxing. Um, uh, going back to the eye injury, it really, I was in limbo. I really didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I, I sealed shut for more than half the summer. You know, you can't really do too much training. The doctors are kind of like start super slow. And you know, it, my wife was just like, if you're going to do it, then you're going to jump all in. You're not tippy toeing in, you're jumping in the water. So she kind of just narrowed it down to perfect perspective for me there. If you're going to do it. You're going to go all the way in. So that's kind of what I did. I kind of pushed the doctor's orders aside and I did my normal training the best I could. And I had conversations with Bootland about it saying, all right, like, how are you feeling? Like, what do you need for you to be, you know, Justin Taylor again? And uh, obviously I wear a different visor uh, to kind of help with uh, the bright stadium type style lighting. And I kind of just pushed through that and then obviously uh, had a pretty remarkable year uh, setting career highs and goals and stuff. So that was like a little bit of motivation. All right, you can fight through just about anything. And then come into the season after that and, you know, you get selected to be an all-star. You know, you're making a splash that you want to do in the career where maybe you do get a, a longer stint in the American Hockey League or opportunities. And boom, just like that, you know, just like an errant hit, you know, you just – side swipe get side swipe like that and see your knee like uh i know this is bad and the doctor right away i just he said something and i said just get out of the room right now like i don't want to talk to anybody i already know my season's done yeah. and that was probably the worst just because i knew things were going so well for me and we had a tremendous team that year so much firepower and to see it get taken away was kind of heartbreaking and then again you know your support cast my wife She's right there and, you know, the six weeks of literally just sitting in a recliner and not being able to move and, you know, she's talking me through it and got a, I got a little depressed, I would say, thinking, oh, crap, am I going to come back from this? I'm a little bit older. It's harder to recover. Uh, but we had a great uh, re therapy, therapy, uh, occupational therapist staff and then we were talking to me through things I couldn't be doing and Booter was just kind of like, we're going to give you an opportunity. You've earned that and you've done so much for this team and obviously stepped back in and uh, obviously got good opportunities on and off the ice. I'm sensing a common theme, <clears throat> excuse me, a common theme among the fans that uh, obviously fans love goalies. That's usually their favorite position they gravitate, gravitate towards. And fans also love fighting. I don't think that's ever going to get out of the game. So you know where I'm going with this. You've, you had a, a few goalie fights in your career uh, and a couple guys asked about it. Ben wanted to know if you've ever been in one. I think we all know the answer to that. And Caleb uh, asked, what's going through your head when you know you have to do it and you start skating down the ice at the other goalie? Um, 
Yeah, not something I like to do at all. So when those moments came uh, going through the head, um, it was a little bit of panic, I think, initially, um, and just trying to protect yourself and maybe try to get a couple of punches in here and there. Um, the last couple goalie fights I was in, one was this morning with my little guy and the other one was before yesterday in the driveway hockey with my little guy. So um, maybe he'll be a fighter um, and a goalie. But, but I didn't really like doing uh, the fighting at all, so I tried to stay away from it um, because I wasn't very good at it. Let's relive uh, one of the moments we've talked about this year, just because I was uh, I was working for a different team and all I saw were the highlights and Joe Roberts' voice. Uh, when Eric Catalyst moonwalked in Kansas City after scoring the goal, which was, I think, one of the coolest celebrations, but obviously they didn't like it too much. The next day, uh, you were put into a, a tough spot. Tell me about it. Yeah, um, I remember we had an emergency backup on the, on the bench as well, so... Um, Anyway, we knew something might happen, and one of their players had grabbed Katsy, and um, he clearly didn't want to fight and shouldn't have had to fight the player that was trying to fight him. And so I just went in and bear hugged that player. And the second that happened, all hell broke loose. And um, I remember looking up, and their goalie's flying down. And uh, Mitch had worked with that goalie a little bit, being with Stockton, um, and said that he loves that stuff. And, and he's a and so, anyway, that goalie's flying down the ice, and Ketsy goes, Marty, goalie's coming. I'm like, yeah, I see him. But uh, I didn't want to fight because we had knee bug on the bench uh, at the time. And um, I remember that goalie wasn't going to give me a choice. And the worst part about the whole thing was my uh, glove was strapped on tight, and I didn't drop him because I didn't want to fight. Then I couldn't get my glove off, so I'm trying to pull it on his shoulder to get my glove off for half the fight, uh, trying to dodge all of his punches. Um, but, uh, yeah, then after that whole melee, having to stay in the game somehow, um, I think Booter talked to the ref and our, they had our captain over there and, um, I'll never forget the e-bug on the bench. I guess the guys he was sitting next to said, uh, Hey, uh, I'm sorry for what's about to happen. Cause he thought, he was <laughs> so anyway, I ended up having to stay in and we ended up losing the game. So it was even worse. I got beat up and then we lost the game on top of it. So, uh, that was a on the, uh, on the catalyst note for a second, because I, I've been thinking this for a long time, and we'll get into you as a coach a little bit later on, but you played with Catalyst, you played with Justin Taylor, you played with Ben Wilson as teammates for a number of years. All of a sudden you go to the bench side and you're coaching those players. Is that weird? Is that an adjustment knowing that you guys were, were teammates and buddies and now you're kind of in an authoritative role? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different for sure, um, but they're all professionals and – guys that have been around for a long time too. Um, so I think even if I hadn't um, played with them, uh, you're going into a position as a younger coach, I guess, and and you have these veteran players that have been around for a long time uh, that maybe, you know, are you telling them what to do or, or whatever is a little bit different. Uh, so it's actually nice having that relationship with those guys. And um, they show me a lot of respect when I am trying to tell them stuff and we have those conversations. So um, it, it is a bit of a blessing actually as well. Uh, Leslie David Baker from the show, The Office came to Kalamazoo this year and I thought it was really cool meeting him and, and seeing him uh, in attendance. I became a fan of the show recently. Um, I, I hadn't ever watched it before I found out he was coming here. And so I wanted to binge watch the show, but one of the cool things we did, you really, kickstarted and, and saw the way through was having a meet and greet opportunity with our corporate partners to meet him in a, a special VIP, um, you know, event before the game started. What was that all about? And, and um, how cool was that to see come through? It was fantastic. Uh, sometimes you get these opportunities and you're able to work with a, a promoter or a celebrity that, that is willing to take these opportunities to, to appreciate and give us the ability to, to be flexible in our experience. So, uh, our corporate partners, obviously, we we need corporate partners. We need uh, community support, whether it be national or local, uh, from business partners to keep this franchise running. Uh, they don't. They they are a massive piece of our business. So uh, to be able to show appreciation for them is is something that we have to do. Uh, we do it annually with our golf outing at Millum. Uh, we love hosting that for the corporate partners every year, um, but. This was an opportunity, something special, something once in a lifetime uh, to, to get the corporate partners down there, 
treat him some food, some drink, uh, and and have a good night. I actually didn't even get to spend too much time with Leslie because I was running around uh, shaking hands with everybody. But uh, we had some uh, potentially new businesses that uh, might be popping up at Wings Event Center there that night as well. So uh, they got to see what it's like uh, to be a part of corporate life with the K-Wings. So. Wido, the bus driver, Wido, wants to know <laughs> <laughs> how past bus experiences traumatized you and how that's helped you appreciate coming to Kalamazoo because I think we have it pretty good here. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So I, no, I don't want to get you, in, I don't want to get you in trouble. So maybe you can be vague about it if you want. Yeah. Um, I played in a couple of places where, uh, the buses were pretty ridiculous. Um, not the most luxurious and, uh, I don't know, didn't really feel safe on it. And then uh, you come to Kalamazoo where, I mean, it's pretty much luxury buses. Every every bunk has a, a DVD player. Um, and the bus driver, like Wido, does a great job keeping it between the rumble strips. Sometimes he hits them and wakes me up at 5 a.m. But he does a pretty good job keeping it between the rumble strips, which is nice. So, uh, yeah, when you, I mean, when you come there and you don't really have to worry about anything and everything's clean and, uh, I mean, you get direct TV or whatever it is, satellite TV on there, and, I mean, it, it helps with the tough travel that we do go through in, in a season because, uh, I mean, some of those road trips are pretty brutal. You're playing in Indy one night and Kansas City the next night, and that's eight hours away, and you're getting in at 7 a.m. So if you got a good place to sleep and a good bus driver, it, it definitely makes those trips a little bit easier. That, uh, that Indy-Kansas City trip that you speak of, too, that, that was the trip that you got your shutout against Indy, right? And then the next night you played in Kansas City, there was like a seven-hour difference or eight-hour drive in between. Yeah. That's a tough task for goalies especially because you guys are, I'm sure, sore after every game. Then you play back-to-back -back nights eight hours apart, coming off of a shutout where your adrenaline's probably at an all-time high. What was that like that weekend? Well, I mean, kind of it. when you're doing that, you're not really thinking. Um, there's no real – downtime to where you're just sitting around thinking about stuff um things obviously went our way that night in indy where we won one nothing in the shootout and felt pretty good about my game but i mean after the game you're on the bus you're eating you're laying down and you're pretty much trying to sleep until you got to go to the rink the next day at four o'clock um i remember i slept probably three or four hours on the bus uh we got in around i don't know seven seven thirty um i think i had breakfast and then went to had breakfast, took a walk or something, went and laid back down, got up for lunch, went and laid back down. And all of a sudden it's time to go to the rink again. And you're like, where did the day go? But um, I mean, especially back to back games, it's really important to get your rest and, and downtime and sooner, like before you even know it, you're playing again and you're just not even thinking. So you're kind of getting to that game mode. It was probably nice in the second game that your team scored eight goals to help you out because because uh, the shutout game was zero zero going into a shootout. Uh, that that shutout game against Indy was your sixth of your career as a pro so far. Coming against your former team and in the fashion it was in a shootout, it was zero zero. Did it make it any sweeter? Yeah, I mean, I I, I love playing in Indy. Actually, um, they uh, they did nothing but great things and support for me when I was there, and honestly, love the city as well. So. Um, I remember my first season in Kalamazoo, I had a couple, a couple tough games in Indy where I, I didn't think I played well, and I kind of, you know, the loss sucks, but even it hurts even more when it's a kind of a place you love. So this season, I think I kind of, you know, played a little bit better when we were there, and it's it's fun to play there. It's a great arena. And it's, it's loud there, too. So uh, it, it does make it a little bit sweeter. You did lead the league at one point in a category. Do you know what category that was? Hmm. No, I'm not sure. Maybe goals. Maybe uh, minor penalties. Oh yeah, probably. <laughs> so, so what do you think about when you have to sit in the penalty box for two minutes? What goes through your mind? It's got to be quiet. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, you know, luckily for me, you know, I, I I'm never quiet. So I kind of was like, look next to me, see next to me, start talking to the person in the box. Like you know, I'm, it, the technically it's our bench. So I got Rooster there, or I got you know one you know Blaney usually sits in the end, so I get to you know kind of see him, you know smirking there so or i can like kind of peep out and see what booter is maybe he's smirking at me or not you know yeah or i can always look perfect. across to see you see what you're up to yeah i mean it's always entertaining up there you know you sat up in the press box next to me uh at some point did you just have a conversation with yourself <laughs> i mean I would mean, you be no one's judging would you, would you be surprised if i did no i mean no one's judging so i, I figured i'd ask it 
oh yeah, I, I guarantee I've had combos with myself. I get bored in the in the box. Because three months in quarantine is a perfect comparison to sitting in a penalty box. You know, you have a lot of moments where you just probably need to sit down and have a conversation with yourself and see what happens. I'm like, honestly, sometimes I get like proud of myself in quarantine. Like I said, like I'm doing, like I said, this, this, uh, this like real estate class on the side, just like doing like kind of like, you know, give me something to do in quarantine. I actually sit there and do it. I'm like, wow. Like I didn't know I could be just quiet and sit here and stare at a computer. I'm like, the minute people get home, it's like, yo, what's up? Like, let's hang, let's talk. Tell me about your day. Tell me about your life. Tell me about, tell me what you like, when did you brush your teeth? What time? I want to know everything. You've, you've done so many of these different types of videos like wings holiday wishes was was your brainchild i mean that was your idea and we just kind of all showed up and did our thing got the players involved and um remind and, me was that another one that mcfadden got cut out of no uh, well technically it's i don't know mcfadden were you in that one because i know you did a voiceover at one point no I, I i don't think i had anything in that one i was gonna say i am a little uh Hurt that I didn't get called in to voice over the league awards. Uh, that is a hidden talent of mine. Really? So I heard this beautiful voice uh, I, around the arena during I, commercials. Uh, when I did John, hear some commercials. On the air. <laughs> so, McFadden, when I first got here and we were getting ready for the season to start, one of the things that I have to do is kind of get our commercials ready and produced and sent to the radio station so when the broadcasts take place, We've got actual commercials for our sponsors. And I didn't want it to be all my voice because obviously you're, you're sick of hearing me as it is. So the commercial breaks are a nice little reprieve where you can listen to somebody else and not the game. So I had McFadden record a couple of them. Um, and I also had you record the open video. So you're right. I, I should have thought about you. Um, your yeah. voiceover talent is, is a hidden gem. And, um, man, we could have used you in the league awards. Right. The next time I need, you know, the next time I need somebody with a little southern drawl, I will. Re yeah. I will think of you. <laughs> and and you got cut out of our first top ten video, which for those who are familiar, it was the one we had Zach Diamond, Tony, and Zach Sar on, telling about the fun facts of Kalamazoo, which the idea kind of stemmed from my appreciation for David Letterman's uh, show back when he was on TV. He had the top ten, right? That's probably self-explanatory. Tim did a great job with how it looked. We were going to have you originally, McFadden, be kind of like the Paul Schaefer of the show. Uh, you know, the, the hair kind of was similar to Paul Schaefer that you got going there. Um, I was going to throw it over to you for a nice quip, and, and you almost made the cut, oh. but I know you were pretty hurt by that. Yeah, that, that one did hurt uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, I, I still am happy with my Waldo joke. But, um, you know, I, that, that's show business, I guess. You, you just can't make the cut every time. But, yeah, well, that, be, that one did hurt quite a bit. To be totally honest, I just got lazy and didn't want to edit you in. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the truth behind the story. Um, we, had a, we had a season to take care of, so. Sorry. Yeah, that's true. And we were my, just, goal this, my goal this season is to get you in two to three. Yeah, we could we could uh, we could find find a way to use your talents. Yeah, I'm hoping you both do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we mentioned Florida State and Manchester United. Tim, is that Neyland Stadium in the background? It is. University of Tennessee. Yeah, it's sad that I know that from a Zoom call background picture. But uh, didn't those teams play in the national championship? They did. They did. And McFadden, you got your master's at Florida State. And Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, your wife has a connection to the University of Tennessee? Yeah, she went to law school there. And so, back, to that, back to that national championship game. Uh, <laughs> do you want to finish it, McFadden? Nope. Okay. We, we don't talk about 98. <laughs> got a couple last easy ones uh, before we wrap it up. Winterfest was announced, uh, obviously, in Toledo. We played in the first ever outdoor game in Toledo a few years back, and, and you were the coach then, and Joel Martin actually was the goaltender for the, the winning team. Um, how are we going to keep Marty warm? I hear his feet get really cold, and uh, he said something about a trench coat and, and foot warmers or something. So is that your job now that he's on the bench next to you? He literally had, like – electronic foot warmers in his skates when he played that game as the starting goalie. Uh, this is not a lie. They literally, the trainer had control with a button, high, medium, low, or off. 
And he's like, I think at one point he's like, turn these things on. <laughs> he came to, um, so um, he is the, he, he's always cold. <laughs> so um, maybe that's because he's skinnier than me and maybe it doesn't bother me. There's a couple arenas that I'm like, eh, it's pretty cold in Wheeling. It's pretty cold in Brampton. You know, there's a couple places where it gets pretty chilly. Uh, um, but um, my juices are pretty flowing and, and sometimes I'm pretty loud out there. So it goes away pretty fast. I usually get cold after because, you know, you get hot in a leather shoe and, you know, you start to sweat a little bit because you're in the game and your intensity takes over. Then that's when I get cold um, for me. Um, you know, sometimes after an intermission, I go back out there. I'm a little chilly, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Those outdoor games uh, to, to have the ability to be part of it once before and, um, you know, I think it's something we use as a recruiting tool even to be part of that. You know, not every player is going to get an opportunity to do that in their career. Um, you know, I know it's pretty common now at the NHL level um, that almost everybody that's going to play there at some point, if you're going to play there for an extended period of time, you're going to get an opportunity to do so. And obviously there's some high-end D1 programs that have done it and some American League teams that have done it. But, you know, at, and we've only had two games ever at our level. Um, and now we'll be the third game ever, and, and we'll get to be part of that. It's truly exciting. And then both organizations do a fantastic job. Toledo does an amazing job hosting the event, um, the way they're supported downtown and, and the way that they support us. And, um, and we also schedule-wise create some days off in between so we can treat it a little bit like a, a, an NHL setup. And um, I know it's probably going to be our first skate of the year, but it'll be really short. We'll do a couple of drills and then I'm going to tell our players to invite family and I'm going to tell our players to invite their kids and um, their parents if they want to. And, um, you know, we might have a short window of ice. that's only going to be an hour long, but we're going to share it. And it's about the experience just as much as it is about the game. One, one feather in your cap, I think with, with the way this all played out mid season, when you guys as a coaching staff took the approach to aggressively go sign Austin Farley from the top Swedish league to get that connection and, and that process started. I just recall you having, having some sort of connection with Austin or knowing him or knowing of him from his college playing days. And it kind of started the conversation. And so I want to give credit where credit is due. You, you were very much a part of that recruiting process and getting Austin Farley to come here. Can you walk us through what that was like? Because that happened quickly. I mean, that was a two- or three-day process, and boom, he was coming here. Yeah, uh, Farley, we were very, very happy to get him. Um, he was coming back from over from Sweden. We saw it online that uh, the transaction was going through, and I remembered um, actually a friend of mine talking about him who trains with him in the summer in Chicago, and I reached out to that friend and I said, hey, do you still know the Farley kid? Uh, how tight are you? Can you connect me with him? Um, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'll say it. I, I ended up talking to Farley on the day of a game in Allen, Texas, um, standing in the hallway about 45 minutes before our game was going to start. And I talked to him probably for 35 minutes and um, really had a long conversation about where he was at and what the next steps were for him. Um, and he was just so appreciative of somebody taking the time and caring about him um, and sharing more about the organization than just, hey, we want you to play here. Um, I think that's something that Joel, Nick, myself, we all do a very good job and all continue to build on what we do well as each other as recruiters, but it's we're true to who we are, right? Like yeah. we care about people, we care about our players. Um, and that shows through, and I think that shows through with the kind of guys that we have that end up here. Our, our character and our culture uh, is extremely strong, and we just want to keep working on building our identity on the ice to push for next year and get the right pieces in the room. So adding Farley at that point of the year, not many people get a player like him, and, and we got lucky. So there's no mixture of that madness. It's I had an old college buddy that just still plays hockey and trains with them, um, and, you know, he was lucky enough to take my phone call or I was like, that's, that's why it's important to have those connections, though. I mean, that's where the networking piece to being a coach and to, to being uh, in this business really can go a long way. We are social distancing here at Bell's. You can tell we're six feet apart and it's a beautiful day outside. And uh, Amy, uh, this partnership has been something that the Kalamazoo Wings and Bell's Brewery have, have done for several years now. Uh, should we kick it off in style? I mean, how many people get to start off their week on a Monday? 10 a.m. With a two-hearted ale. With a two-hearted ale. 
social um, distance so, cheers social distance cheers <laughs> um and here in true bell's form i believe we may have a train coming oh. so we'll see we'll still make sure you get all the info and we're still going to have some fun but uh if a train does happen to uh come our way just bear with us we are live right and just winging it it would only be fitting that a train would come on through and honk its horn a few times and uh interrupt the show but i think that just makes it all the more fun because you're right we are just winging it <laughs> most of these just winging it episodes have been via quarantine via zoom chat uh, so this is very unique. It's episode 14, and it's the first time we've gotten to do a live show, first of all. And second of all, an in-person interview. Uh, again, social distancing here, enjoying it too hard at telling you about these jerseys. So Amy, uh, first of all, with everything that you do for Bells and working with the K-Wings in this specific promotion, uh, what can you tell us about the partnership and kind of how it's developed up to this point? Um, this year we are super excited to once again partner with you all. Um, I believe this is our fifth year doing a specialty game. Um, we were, were talking about it when we first got started. I think Winter White was the first uh, beer that we focused on um, about five years ago and we did a blue ice game. Hold on, we're going to pause because of the train. Oh. sitting in the Bell's Beer Garden and enjoying a beer and yeah. I mean if a train doesn't come by when you're out here something might not be right so. You mentioned the Turner Cup too and, and winning that fairly early on and where does that stand as far as your memories with the K-Wings as a player? Do you have any other memories that really you would put towards the top? Of no the that, that, that is the biggest the biggest uh, achievement was the winning the Turner Cup because uh, we would we would go to uh, Grand Rapids and, and we would lose like four three and we would come back here and we we'd beat them like eight to two and then go back there it'd be like five four and and it's just that we just couldn't win in that rink and we'd kill them here and the last game we had uh, uh, Ronnie Wilson was out and Tommy Milani Tommy Ross they were out and Atlanta Candy our best players were all out. And we went into their arena and, and we won the game the last the last period we pulled it out and, and uh, I remember going into the last period thinking this is it I mean we're gonna win it or it just wasn't meant to be and the guys that won it together we just you know we, we cared each other for each other and uh, uh, we just were so proud to be a Kalamazoo wing win the Turner Cup together and you know it's for myself it's only I only won it once there are a couple guys that won it twice, and uh, that's a big thrill because they won it in Fort Wayne the next year. But it, it was that was my big, big deal. Playing in the NHL, that's always your goal. Right. But to win the Turner Cup was the biggest, biggest thing. We knew we were nominated for seven awards. Some of us knew that we won an award or two uh, on the show, um, but the rest not of the staff, you. not you, the rest of the staff didn't. So uh, what was that like to, to have everybody back together at the new house to watch the show virtually, which it had never been virtually shown for the fans. It had always been just for the ECHL employees. So it was, uh, first off, it was a lot of fun. It's great to see everyone. I mean, just to get the, the nine of us back together, um, it felt good. It, it's kind of weird too at times. We haven't been <laughs> together. So, uh, but it was, it was neat to watch it on our big screen TV uh, and knowing the work that Tim and you, John, put into it, and then myself with the, the team services committee for the league, it was so it was so cool. And the neatest part about the whole thing is that the fans of hockey of the ECHL, no matter for what whatever um, city they're from, could have watched the awards too, which was the first time that happened. And that was thanks to to Tim and and his ideas. So we we need to get that guy on here again and have him interviewed. He's already been on once. Maybe he can be the next recent interview. It's it's not his favorite. Uh, I can tell you that much. You can tell he's uncomfortable, but he's a trooper for for putting up with me for an hour or however long our conversation was. Um, the, the the two awards we won: marketing department of the year. 
how far that operation has come in the collaboration that we, we have several people that are involved in, in marketing um, in one sh way, shape or form. But to see that come to fruition and to win that award this year, I uh, had to had to feel pretty good. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things I could say about that award. Um, it certainly you summed it up really well, John. This that job used to be a one man show. Uh, when I first uh, walked into the K-Wings franchise almost six years ago. And now it's grown to the point where, uh, because we're part of the Greenleaf Hospitality Group family, there is a team of people uh, responsible for that, along with our creative team at the K-Wings. So when you say it, the saying it takes a village is really true. So we came a long way and I'm so proud of that award and that it's a team award. It's not one individual person, it's all of us. Back here at Wings Event Center, you played here for a number of years. You've been here several times since then. Does it bring back memories every time you step through those doors? It, it certainly does. You know, and, and I, you know, just sitting in here and looking around the facility and I see the changes they've made that, you know, are, are all for the better. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I'm always looking back to thinking, Gee, I used to sit on the bench right there the odd time, which I never hated. I, I never loved sitting on the bench. You know, being a goalie, you want to be out there in the midst of things. Um, you know, I, I remember the, the fans cheering, you know, the signboard saying, Georgie, Georgie. Just a lot of those things that, that really bring back goosebumps to, you know, being back in the day. You bring, you bring up a good point. I've never in my life heard a goaltender say, yeah, I could use a night off and I want to sit on the bench tonight. I mean, you might be thinking it if you're playing every game and you played a lot of games. Rarely did you sit on the bench. I got to think that every goalie likes to have that one night off, even though you want to compete. But I've never heard a goalie admit it saying, no, nah, I, I, I need a night off. You know, I don't think any goalie would ever admit that. Even, even if you're sitting on the bench, maybe a little bit in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, I get three or four goals on that guy so I can get back out there and <laughs> and do my thing and and entertain the people once again and and that's what it's all about it's you know it's entertaining the people that come to watch you play and you know putting on a good product for them